It's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here to Warwick. Uh, you must excuse my voice, I'm just recovering from a cold, but I hope I last it out. I believe that in all the years I was at Warwick, I don't recall ever having had an LMS Society meeting here. So, double pleasure, and treble pleasure that it's a meeting in honour of the memory of Mariam Mizakani. Um, I'm sure I don't need to tell people about Mariam, but maybe two things that you don't know. Um, the symposium that I organised here in 2006 to 2007, uh, she was one of the invited <coughs> speakers in the first uh, sort of mini workshop that we had. She gave three lectures about the beautiful work that we're going to be hearing about this afternoon. And the other thing is that Mariam was an honorary member of the London Mathematical Society, elected in our 150th anniversary year, 2006. Uh, well, thanks to the uh, LMS, uh, <laughs> thanks to the LMS for giving this opportunity. Uh, as many of you, as most of you know, this meeting is taking place during a week-long uh, workshop on hydrodynamics. And Mariam was an important member of the Eichler Dynamics community. So when the LMS asked us if uh, this uh, today's event was compatible with our uh, workshop, we were we enthusiastically uh, agreed that it was. And um, <clears throat> so um, uh, it seemed like a, a, an excellent uh, pairing. Um, uh, many uh, of us in this room were uh, friends, colleagues, uh, uh, friends and colleagues of Mariam, and she was an inspiration to, uh, to others of us. Um, there have been uh, many events uh, commemorating uh, Mariam and her life. Uh, this afternoon, uh, our plan is to focus on some parts of her work that deserve to be more widely known. Uh, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> Mariam did her undergraduate work in Iran, was a graduate student of Herbert McMullen at Harvard University, and graduated in 2004. She was a Clay Research Fellow and Professor at Princeton and Stanford, and received a Fields Medal in 2014, and she died at two, in 2017 at the age of 40. Um, <clears throat> Uh, she was, um, yes, uh, our first uh, speaker is uh, Alex Wright. Uh, Alex was a colleague and collaborator with uh, Mariam. He's an assistant professor at Stanford University and a Clay Research Fellow. Uh, he graduated from the University of Chicago in 2014 uh, and was a student of Alex Eskin. Uh, he will be taking a position at the University of Michigan. Uh, Alex. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so it's, it's my pleasure to talk today about some of uh, Mariam's uh, thesis. Mariam wrote such an extraordinary and content-rich thesis that actually both Anton and I will be able to give uh, separate but related talks just on her thesis. Um, uh, and, and so I'm going to talk about the part of our thesis that has to do uh, with big Peterson volumes of moduli spaces and the intersection theory. Um, and as I, I'm sure you'll hear more from Anton, it's, it's evident talking to people during this week-long conference that uh, the ideas that I'll relate to you here are very much still alive uh, and active in our community. Um, but uh, I hope this will be fun for, for some of you who, like me, are too young to have ever heard uh, Mariam speak about this, or who, for some other reason, didn't hear Mariam speak about uh, this, this extraordinary work. Um, so uh, it all has to do with uh, hyperbolic metrics on surfaces and the moduli spaces, or universes of all possible hyperbolic metrics on a surface. Um, and as anybody who's involved in this business can tell you uh, the best way to make a surface is out of pants. <coughs> and, or conversely, you can take a surface that you already made 
and uh, draw on it a maximal collection of disjoint simple closed curves. So the word simple means that a curve doesn't intersect itself. So if you've drawn in enough curves, then when you cut them, you will have cut your, your surface into pants. So a pants means a sphere with three boundary components. Um, and uh, one of the most fundamental facts of hyperbolic geometry is that for any three non-negative numbers, there's a unique hyperbolic pants uh, who, so that all the three uh, cuffs or boundary circles are geodesics and they have those three lengths. Okay, so, uh, you know, pants as I've drawn them uh, uh, illustrate the case where the lengths are all positive, but the length can actually be zero and that indicates a cusp. Uh, so, again, there's a unique pants with any three cuff lengths and having uh, a collection of pants, you can glue them along cuffs that have the same lengths. Okay? And when you do that, there's some amount that you can twist them. Okay? So, uh, and in this way, if you sort of, you make sure the lengths match up and you, you glue all the cuffs, you'll get a closed surface. Also important in this talk will be if you just glue some of the cuffs, you'll then get a surface with boundary. And then these play a very large uh, role in, um, in our work. Um, and then actually you get every hyperbolic uh, surface in this way. So it's, it's one of, again, the basic facts of hyperbolic geometry that um, if you take a system of disjoint curves on a surface that don't intersect each other or themselves, you can tighten them to unique geodesic representatives that are uh, still simple and still don't intersect each other. Uh, so in this way you can sort of take a sort of topological pants decomposition and tighten the curves, and then uh, you can get actual hyperbolic pants. Um, uh, okay. So uh, just in terms of the numerology, uh, the number of curves present in a, a pants decomposition is 3g minus 3 plus n. So that's the maximal number of disjoint uh, simple closed curves that are not isotopic to each other. Uh, so uh, if you want to build a surface then, you'll need to specify uh, these uh, 3g minus 3 lengths that are the lengths of these cuffs. Um, and, and these are called the length parameters. But then additionally, when you, you glue together the pants, there's some amount of twisting that you can do. Uh, so there's also 3g minus 3 twist parameters. So these give you what are called essential Nielsen coordinates for tight space. Uh, so you have the 3g minus 3 plus n length coordinates that are all positive, and the 3g minus 3 uh, twist coordinates that are just any real number. Uh, so what hyperbolic space is, is the space of marked hyperbolic uh, surfaces. So this marking is some amount of combinatorial data uh, that keeps track of some extra information. Um, if you want to get rid of that extra combinatorial data, which maybe was not what you were after, you quotient uh, by the, the mapping class group. Uh, and when you quotient tight space by the mapping class group, you get uh, the moduli space MGN. This is the moduli space of genus G, hyperbolic surfaces with N cusps. Um, so a, a point in the moduli space represents a hyperbolic surface with cusps. Uh, and so it, it's quite believable, given uh, Benjamin Nielsen coordinates, that this is a, a manifold, or rather an orbifold. It actually also has a complex structure, and it's an algebraic variety, and it shows up all over mathematics. Okay, it's one of the central objects in algebraic geometry. In, uh, it, it's very interesting to people who study symplectic topology, as we'll see today. Uh, it has many interesting metrics. It shows up in theoretical physics. Um, it's really one of the hubs of mathematics and theoretical physics. Um, so in terms of the symplectic geometry, uh, there's, there's sort of an obvious symplectic form you can put on Tychmuller space. And that's you sum d twist wedge d length. It's just sort of a natural thing. In terms of eventual Nielsen coordinates, that would be the standard symplectic form. Um, uh, so uh, there's a miracle that happens, though, that if you use a different pants decomposition of the same surface and you sub d twist with d lengths in the new pants decomposition, you actually get the same two form, the same symplectic form. This is quite surprising because if you 
have two different fancy compositions. The transition functions between the two potential Nielsen coordinates are quite complicated. But nonetheless, when you, you change from one fancy composition to another, uh, it doesn't change this form d to a square d length. Uh, so in other words, this, this symplectic form is invariant under the mapping class group, and it uh, descends to a symplectic form on moduli space. Uh, so that's not really how uh, this symplectic form was discovered. It's actually part of a, a Taylor package. So there are many interesting metrics uh, on, on moduli space. Uh, one of them is the Bay peterson metric, which is a, a negatively curved Ramanian metric. It's sadly incomplete, uh, but it's very interesting. In this, uh, you know, uh, people knew about that, that metric and its associated uh, symplectic form before they knew about this formula. And so the, the way with this was discovered is really uh, Scott Wilker discovered that this, this gives a formula for that uh, symplectic form coming from that Taylor uh, structure. Okay, and uh, there are a number of reasons to be interested in this, but already you see that the symplectic form is going to be intimately related to the hyperbolic geometry of individual surfaces, just in terms of its definition, in terms of hyperbolic lengths and twists in these special Niels coordinates. That's all the hyperbolic geometry. By the way, are there any questions so far? I know this is a big auditorium, but I would like you to all feel free to ask questions throughout the talk. I've actually intentionally left some time for questions, so it won't slow me down too much. So I hope you just you know put up your hand and shout out whenever you have a question. Um, is, is that like a simple description of the Bay Peterson metric? Uh, there is a simple description of the Bay Peterson metric. Yeah, or, or it's easier to say what the co-metric is. So the co-tangent space to moduli space of the space of quadratic differentials. And there it's, it's sort of a natural L2 metric. So you take the product of two quadratic differentials and you divide by the, the um, hyperbolic area form and you integrate it. So there is a, there's a, it's sort of just a natural L2 metric. Um, any other questions? OK. Um, so I want to think about this in an example. Uh, and I'll think about it in the example of a once punctured torus. Okay, so, or rather, a, a torus with a hyperbolic metric in one cusp. Okay, so this cusp is sort of something that stretches off to infinity and gets very thin. It looks like this picture on the right. Um, now, a pan's decomposition for a once punctured uh, torus is very, very easy. You can only have one curve disjoint from you can't, if you have one simple closed curve, you can't draw another one disjoint from it. Unless it goes around the cusp, that's not allowed. Um, uh, so you, you, you tighten that one uh, curve to a geodesic and you cut it, and you get a pants. So this is a degenerate pants. One of the top lengths is zero, but as I said, that's allowed. Okay, so it's a pants where two of the top lengths are positive and the same, and the third top length is zero. So the eventual Nielsen coordinates. Um, Say that you should specify the length of this geodesic, which could be any positive number, and then the twist that you glue this uh, geodesic together with itself. Um, and uh, so there's just two coordinates, so in other words, this moduli space is the surface. And the, the eventual Nielsen symplectic form, d twist wedge d length, that's just an area form. And we can ask uh, what's the, the area of this moduli space. Or frequently, I'll say volume because you know, in general, if it was an n-dimensional thing, we would say volume. Um, uh, okay, so let's let's try to think about this. So, as we've all taught our calculus students, you can compute the area of a space by integrating uh, the function one over it. Okay, here it would be slightly more convenient to, to uh, integrate the function one half. And what's amazing is this is a very beautiful formula for the number one half. Uh, due to McShane. Uh, so in this formula, um, uh, one half is equal to the sum over all the simple closed geodesics, so all the geodesics that don't intersect themselves, of one over one plus e to the length of that geodesic. Okay, so you have infinitely many geodesics. There are only finally many less than a given length. Anton will tell you more about how many there are. Um, but there are infinitely many. If you change the hyperbolic metric, for example, you change a length parameter, the length of that curve is changing. Obviously, that's the length parameter. So if you change the metric, each individual length is changing, and yet the sum is constant. 
So the, the real miracle here is the sum does not depend on the hyperbolic metric you take on the, the, the once function torus. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit later where this comes from. But for now, I want to uh, tell you how to use this to compute the volume of m1 lines. And I should say that uh, this was not the, the first calculation of the volume of m11. That was done, done previously. Uh, in particular, Scott Walker gave a computation of it. Um, but, but this is a, a way that uh, Mariam discovered to compute it that uh, connected with a lot of other things that allowed her to, to greatly generalize this. OK, so um, the, the computation involves thinking about an infinite cover of this moduli space that I'll call M11 star. Um, and what this moduli space consists of is that a point in this moduli space is uh, a hyperbolic uh, torus with one cusp together with the choice of a uh, simple closed geodesic, a geodesic that doesn't intersect itself. Um, and as I said, this is an infinite cover of M11. The cover, you just forget the geodesic. There are infinitely many possible choices of geodesic that you could have picked. Um, and the reason this is related to that sum is because that sum was a sum over simple closed uh, geodesic. So that, in other words, that, that's the sum over the fibers of this map. OK. Um, uh, the other reason this is helpful is because this is the actually much easier space to describe. Um, Benchel-Nielsen coordinates don't actually provide coordinates on moduli space. The tricky thing is, you know, you don't, um, you know, there are so many different choices of a fancy composition, or in this case, there are so many different choices of a simple closed curve. But on M11 star, you have a given choice of simple closed curve, so you can use that to make your fancy composition. So you can consider the length of that, and you can cut it open, and you can have your pants, and then you can consider the twist that you glue it together with. Um, and the length can be any positive number. Uh, the twist, however, can be any number between one and the length, because when you, when you twist and you just keep twisting, you get back to where you started. There's some, you know, you go all the way around and you come back to where you started on the circle. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'll show you what's really a very short computation of the, the volume. Um, so as I said, the volume you get by integrating a constant function over the space. So I'm integrating this, this giant sum, which is just the number one half. And I'm, of course, I'm doing this with respect to the big Peterson symplectic form that locally looks like e twist wedge d length. Um, and uh, now, since the fibers of the map from M11 star to M11 are, are the thing we're summing on over we twisted, pass to this infinite cover and get rid of the sum. So this is a, a, a neat trick. You, instead of having the sum, you pass to an infinite cover whose fiber corresponds to the thing you're summing over. Um, uh, so now I just have a single function, no sum. And now this is very concrete, right? This uh, M11 star, the length can be anything, as I said, between 0 and infinity. The, the twist can be anything between 0 to L. And then that, that function, I have that length, that's just the, the, the length, that's the potential Nielsen parameter. Um, so here I get a very concrete integral. Because so this is you know, not an entirely trivial integral. I don't know if your calculus students do it, can do it. But it's a known integral, it's pi squared over 12. So for example, Wolfram Alpha has this integral. Um, uh, so that means the volume of the moduli space is pi squared over six. Okay, any, any questions about that? Okay, again, we've computed the volume by, by passing to an infinite cover where we got rid of our sum. Uh, and then we got an explicit integral. Um, okay, so, so here's how Kanye was able to generalize this to compute volumes of other moduli spaces. Uh, and to do that, she needed to generalize an exchange identity. So she proved what she called a generalized exchange identity, which I've written for you here. Um, and it concerns uh, Riemann surfaces with boundary, sometimes called ordered Riemann surfaces, ordered hyperbolic surfaces, <laughs> but a hyperbolic surface with a number of geodesic boundary circles. 
Um, so I have a hyperbolic surface with boundary circles beta 1 through beta n uh, that are lengths L1 through Ln. Um, and I get that L1 is the two big sums. So the first sum uh, is over pairs of curves that together with beta 1 form a pants. Pairs of curves in the interior of the surface. And in the second sum, I use beta 1 and another boundary circle, beta i, and this curve in the surface uh, to form a, a pants. Okay, so these two sums really is sort of uh, summing over all possible ways to have a pants, uh, including beta 1. And there are two possibilities. Either there's a second boundary circle involved or not. Um, and then there's some function of the length of the cop. Um, in a sense, so actually to get that version, you should divide this by L1 and then let L1 go to zero. You don't want to directly plug in L1. But yes, they, they are some. So if, if uh, you want to know what these functions are, you might not like the answer. Um, but there they are, there's some explicit function. Okay, so I want to give you some idea of where this comes from. Because to me, when I first saw it, it really seemed like a mystery. Where does that come from? What does it mean? Um, uh, the idea behind this is to um, imagine you're sitting on this boundary circle, beta 1, and to shoot out ortho g d6. So you leave at 90 degrees, um, and you shoot out this g d6. Now, your intuition is that typically what would happen is um, this, this, bound, this, this ortho g d6 would intersect itself. The g is sort of go crazy. Or maybe it would just run into another boundary component first. One of the two things should happen. It should be very, very unlikely um, that uh, the, the ortho g is it continues forever without intersecting itself uh, or intersecting a boundary component. And that's correct. Uh, in fact, uh, Berman and series proved more than that. Uh, but certainly, for almost every point on the boundary, um, if you shoot off that ortho geodesic, it will, it will either intersect itself or it will, it will hit another boundary circle. Um, but there are some special places that you could uh, sit on the boundary and you could shoot off an ortho geodesic and it could, it could wind around another simple closed curve or another boundary component without ever intersecting itself. Okay, so now I want you to imagine that that other simple closed curve is part of a pants. So uh, if you have a geodesic that intersects itself, you can imagine sort of moving the point where you start the ortho geodesic. And you'll get some interval of curves where it intersects itself. And on the boundary of that, it will sort of wind around um, some simple closed curves. And those will tell you that this, this interval on the boundary, uh, on this beta 1 circle, corresponds to some pair of pants. So roughly speaking, almost every point uh, on this boundary beta 1 is an ortho geodesic that, that intersects itself for a boundary, and you divide that up into <coughs> intervals corresponding to pants. And then you compute the sizes of those intervals, and you say, okay, well, the sum of those sizes of intervals is the boundary length. And indeed, you can see this, uh, this identity exactly gives you the boundary length. That's L1, the length. Okay, so these correspond to intervals of ortho geodesics that intersect themselves for the, the boundary length. Uh, so uh, this uses some dynamics, the result of permanent series that says it's, it's, you know, for almost every point, uh, you'll intersect, the, the ortho geodesic will intersect itself or another boundary component. Uh, and then it also uses some computations of hyperbolic geometry in which you have to come up with these formulas uh, by computing, you know, what happens in, in a pair of pants. Okay, so any questions about uh, about exchange dynamics? Really, they're quite miraculous, and a lot of what uh, a lot of Marin's thesis has a lot to do with the machine identities. Can you determine the pair of pants? Like, in quantum trajectory, where you have to have the probability. The way I think about it is, you have this you have this ortho geodesic that intersects itself, and then you sort of move it in either direction, and then when you reach the boundary, then you'll see what the cop is. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, um, so uh, really a lot of what Mirza Khani did uh, can 
considered surfaces like this that have boundary circles uh, of some positive length. Uh, so I should introduce some notation of that. So MGN, L1 through LN, this will be the moduli space of hyperbolic surfaces with boundary circles of length Li. Um, and the case Li is equal to zero, and that represents passives. Um, so for example, if I just plug in all zeros for the Li, this is just the space MGN of genus P surfaces with n passives. Um, and really, part of what was novel in, in, in Mari's work is that she allowed boundary circles. For example, before her work, people could already compute a Peterson volumes of m, g, n with no boundary circles, but people had not considered as much uh, these larger moduli spaces where you, you have uh, boundary circles. Okay, so uh, this space uh, where you have boundary circles of fixed length, it also has a Bay Peterson symplectic form. Okay, in fact, the formula is identical before. And from the beginning, I said, you know, if you want to build a surface with boundaries, you start assembling pants and you just don't finish. You have some sort of leftover boundaries. But from where you have assembled it, you have twist and length parameters, and you just take some twist wedge T length. So it's still a perfectly good symplectic form uh, on the moduli space. Um, it's not Kähler anymore. And in fact, this moduli space doesn't have a natural compact structure. Um, but there's no twist of the boundary. There's no length of the boundary because the lengths are fixed. Yeah, you have fixed lengths of the boundary, so you don't get coordinates from the boundary circles. You only get coordinates from where you move two pants together. Then for those curves, you get a length and a twist parameter. And you get no parameters from the boundary circles, because they're, they're fixed. OK. So again, we have this symplectic form, and you can take a, a top wedge power of it uh, to get a volume form. Um, and uh, since I'm going to talk a lot about volumes, uh, I'll denote by VG and L1 through LN the J. Peterson volume of this moduli space. Um, and so, for example, we've already computed the V110, so that's the volume of M110, or in other words, just M11, we computed that as pi squared over 6. Okay. Um, so, I want to just give you a little bit of a quick example of. of how to deal with boundaries. This may go a little quickly, but uh, maybe you can take it in impressionistically. Um, uh, so I want to compute for you the volume of M11L, where you now have a, a boundary component. Uh, so uh, in this case, the chain's identity is fairly simple. Again, there's only one way you can have a pants, and that's if you have a simple closed geodesic, uh, and you've got it in measure pants. There's no second boundary, so that other R function doesn't show up. Um, so you take McShane's identity, and as before, I can integrate this and pass to an infinite cover and get some sort of identity from that. Uh, and in this case, that, that identity gives me that L times V11L. That's what we're expecting, because in this case, I'm going to integrate the constant function L. So when I integrate that, I'll get L times V11L, and I'll, I'll get this, uh, this integral. Um, so I, I don't know if you remember anything about these DNR functions that I flashed up. They're sort of nasty functions. They're not so easy to integrate directly. Um, but their derivative is a little bit nicer. So you can take the derivative of, uh, of this D function, and you get some fairly nice thing that looks more like what we had before. Um, and so uh, really what we do is we compute the derivative of L times uh, the volume of L. And if you do that, you get this, this integral, and that's some integral which, again, is not entirely trivial, but that you can do. Uh, and when you compute that, you get that V11L is pi squared over 6 plus uh, L squared over 24. Okay, okay, again, that went quickly. I didn't intend that you follow the computation in detail. The point is that there's a way of using, there's a con of using McShane's identity uh, to still compute the, the volume uh, of this space um, it's a little tricky now because the functions aren't necessarily so easy to integrate, so you have to be a little bit careful about how you do it. Is there a subtlety with passing the derivative of passing the I don't think so. Um, okay, so uh, anyway, this is interesting already because this is a polynomial. Uh, and again, it's, it's part of, uh, I think, a new perspective that Mirzakhani uh, had that you shouldn't think of these volumes in isolation when you're thinking of this as a function of L. 
we did turn the tree in a quadratic function. Uh, that's what's interesting is that uh, the boundary gets bigger, uh, the, the space uh, surfaces get bigger. It's sort of interesting to think about the isolation from the commutation. Okay, so uh, Mirzakhani was able to generalize this, that's, that's what's wonderful about this point of view, um, to get that these, uh, these volumes, these Bay Peterson volumes of these spaces of surfaces, are always polynomial in the lengths. Even better than the polynomials in the lengths. And even better than that, she can tell you a bit about the coefficients. So the coefficients are positive numbers that are rational times the power of pi. So she can do this. Um, and more than that, really the point here is she can explicitly recursively compute these. See, that's what McShane's identities get for you. You go to this cover, you have this pants, you cut off the pants, and now you have integrals involving surfaces built out of one less pants. Okay, so you do this you, every time you, you sort of lose the pants, and this is where you inductively compute uh, the, the Lee Peterson uh, volumes. And you get that they're always well known. Yes? So isn't it shocking that there's no algebraic geometry? There's no algebraic geometry at all, that's correct. Uh, it's purely analytic, there's also no combinatorics, which will maybe be notable later. So everything is purely analytic. Uh, with some dynamics coming in in the, the proof of machine's identities and the generalized machine's identities. Other questions? There's no common parts in the X1 can't be common. Um, I'll say more later what I meant by the common. Okay, so um, Right, so so far we've introduced these spaces of uh, Riemann surfaces with boundary. We said they have a nice uh, notion of volume that just corresponds to d twist wedge d length when you express them in terms of pants. And uh, we've somehow, or rather, years of Connie has somehow managed to recursively compute the volumes and find that they're polynomials using the shape that So now I want to completely change gears and talk about the topic of intersection theory on it. So frankly, just what, what I've already shown you, I think that already would have been an absolutely spectacular and mind-blowing thesis. But that was only you know, roughly one-third of Marin's thesis. And uh, what made it sort of exponentially more interesting was that she related the different things to each other. Okay, so ultimately, I'm only talking about one thing today, so it seems like I'm switching gears, but I'll come back to May Peterson volumes. Um, and to talk about uh, intersection theory, it will be convenient for me to use the Dewey-Mumford compactification of uh, the moduli space. And if you haven't seen this compactification before, it's a very intuitive uh, uh, object. The idea is, you know, maybe one of these length parameters would go to zero. So you'd sort of be pinching a curve. And when you do that, you sort of almost develop a cusp. Uh, and you should add this to the space to make it compact. So that's exactly what you do. So here on one side, I've drawn a surface with two cusps, and I've drawn a red curve and a blue curve. You can imagine if the length of the red curve and the blue curve went to zero, you get something that looked like this. So if all those sort of thin bits, those would be actually infinite cusps that you somehow declare to be glued together. Um, so uh, the Dewey Mumford compactification consists of pictures like that on the face. And it's again a nice space, it's a, it's a nice smooth floor of a fold. Um, it's, uh, it's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, so now there's a, a complex line bundle over this space uh, given by uh, the, the tangent line to the cusp. Okay, and to think about this, it, it helps to actually to change a little bit uh, the, the perspective. This cusp sort of seems infinitely far away, right, because it sort of goes on forever. But you can sort of forget about the metric and just think about it a Riemann surface, in which case it just looks locally like a disk minus that point. And it's only when you put the hyperbolic metric on it that that starts to seem far away. Uh, or you can even put that in, put that point in and call it a marked point. Um, and so you really have marked points instead of cusps. So then you just have a, a, you know, a, a Riemann surface, uh, so it uh, locally looks like a complex disk, and you have this point, and you can look at the tangent. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna try to take the the tangent line there. Okay, so just 
Yeah, so these, you can get nodes by collapsing the curves. And in a node, you can have two components. But these cusps, the thing that start out as cusps, they never get joined to anything else. So they're the cusps and nodes are sort of, they look the same, they're sort of, you know, in the hyperbolic metric, they're cusps. If you just put the point in and think about a stream of surface with a mark point. But they're sort of separate. Um, so anyways, this is this complex line bundle given by, so you can use the tangent line. Uh, it's more standard to use the, the dual to the tangent line, or the cotangent line at the I of R point. Uh, so this gives a complex line bundle, um, and we can take its turn class. Uh, and its, it's turn class will give an element of H2 of the Dewey property application. So we have a second uh, cohomology class. Uh, and don't worry if you're not used to thinking about these things, I'm going to try to do some examples uh, to, to make it seem more concrete. Um, but first, I just want to say that uh, the simplicity of this definition really, um, at least to first, to me, it wasn't so clear why this would be related to everything else. But it is related to everything else. So these, these um, side classes, as they're called, the churn classes of these line bundles, they're related to all sorts of different things. So it's certainly they're related to theoretical physics and string theory. Um, I, uh, they're related to combinatorial mo models for moduli space. Uh, they're related to the combinatorics of the branch covers of surfaces and Hurwitz numbers. They're related to big Peterson geometry, as we're going to see today, and much more. Um, uh, but uh, some of those connections are a little bit more advanced. I think to, to help understand what data these encode, it, it helps to start with something a little bit more naive. So, um, we can consider a family of genus G uh, surfaces uh, over a base which is itself a surface. And let's suppose this family is equipped with a section. So, in other words, there's a, a map from the base to MG1, where over a point of the base, I send it to the fiber with the, the section as the, the mark point or the cusp. Uh, and, uh, you might ask, so given this family, I have this section. You might ask, for example, what's the self-intersection number of this section? So if I just perturb this section a little bit, then how many times does it intersect itself? Well, to perturb the section, what you should do is you should pick a, a, a tangent vector, sort of the vertical direction at every point, and push the section by it. So that, that tangent vector looks like a section of the dual of L1. Okay, so L1 was the cotangent line, so really it's the dual. Um, so you're taking a section of the, the line bundle given by the, the tangent to the, to the mark point or the section. Um, and the self-intersection number is just the number of times that that, that section vanishes. I mean, that section is the degree of the line bundle. In other words, it's, um, it's uh, the side class integrated over the the subset of mg1 that you get from mapping this base into mg1. Okay, and you're going to minus because of the difference between tangent line and cotangent line. Okay, so that's one sort of naive thing you can get immediately out of uh, side classes. Um, but I think even more than that, it, it will help you if you see some of them computed. Uh, and you know, the natural way to compute them, well, there are many ways to compute them. One way of computing them is to pick a meromorphic section of this line bundle. And then the, the churn class is dual to the divisor uh, given where the section is 0 minus the locus where the section is infinity. OK, and we'll use that uh, to compute an example over the moduli space of, uh, of genus 0 surfaces with 5 cusps or 5 mark points. And I'll use psi 4 and psi 5. Not that it makes a difference. Um, so to sort of parse what we're going to do, recall that each side class lives in H2. So the product of two of them lives in H4. Um, and M05 is itself four real dimensional. So this is a top cohomology class. So in other words, I can get an actual number out of this. And I just integrate it over this space. And I pair it with the fundamental class. Um, Okay, so actually, we won't need to use meromorphic sections. It turns out we can find holomorphic sections 
And really, what this, uh, this integral or intersection number will do is it will count intersections between these devices. OK. Any, any questions about the setup? Um, so uh, I think a lot of the people from the conference will like this very much, because we'll draw some flat pictures. Uh, so before I worry about just what's happening at that the, the fourth mark point and the fifth mark point, I want to think about the whole the whole uh, the whole surface. So actually, for each of these surfaces in N zero five, uh, there's a unique meromorphic one form that I'll call eta one two um, that is holomorphic except that it has simple poles of residue one and minus one uh, at z one and z two respectively. Um, so as many of the participants in the conference will know, this one form induces a flat metric in which uh, this, uh, this sphere looks like an infinite cylinder. And the two mark points are at either side. And the fact that the residue is, is, is one means that this has circumference one. Um, so I, I have these two points at infinity, z1 and z2, and then the other three mark points are there. So this is not at all a picture of a hyperbolic metric. This is a picture of a flat metric. Very different. Um, and just for the experts, I'll say that this is what it looks like uh, in M05. In M05 bar, you have nodes. Uh, and if there are nodes, then this, this form may also have poles with opposite residues of the nodes. And we'll see in a second. That was for the experts. So now I want to think about what happens when I go to the boundary. So one way I can go to the boundary is I can pinch the curve around uh, Z4 and Z5. Remember, that's how I go to the boundary between the I'll pinch uh, some curves. Um, and you can think of that as z4 and z5 colliding, although it's sort of symmetric. You can equally well think that z1, z3, and z2 are sort of colliding. Really, what's happening is they're separated by this pinch. Um, OK, so when I do this, the differential I get, well, it's just the same differential on that cylinder, and it's identically zero on that sphere that's bubbled off. So in particular, that would be 0 and z4 and z5 because it's 0 on that whole uh, component. Um, it's a little different, however, though, when one of the two poles, either z1 or z2, uh, collides with one of the three other points. In that case, you get something like what I've drawn here. So here I sort of pinch something to separate z1 and z3 from the rest. Uh, and if that happens, what the, the flat metric looks like is you have these sort of two infinite cylinders, sort of at infinity in between the zone and a node. I still have the two mark points C1 and C2 on either side. Okay, so again, at this point, um, uh, this differential is everywhere non-zero, except for the poles at Z1 and Z2 of the node. So for to get this differential to be zero anywhere, I have to do this bubbling off. Uh, and separate the points from Z1 and Z2. Okay, so uh, I built this um, this eta one two, um, and uh, really, it's sort of a, a global version of understanding what's going on in the cotangent direction, because the differential one form just sort of at a point is a is a cotangent vector. Uh, so I can take the value of that at the fourth uh, point and use that to get a holomorphic section of the line bundle L4. So I take the value of, uh, of eta 1, 2 at the fourth mark point to get a holomorphic uh, section of L4. And this is uh, 0 exactly for things like this, where the, the fourth point uh, gets, gets bubbled off and is separated from the infinite cylinder. Um, so in other words, this is 0 for point collisions that separate Z4 from Z1 and Z2. Uh, and there's two ways, there are three ways for that to happen. I can have the first and second mark point is going to separate the other three, or I can also have um, uh, Z3 or Z5 in with the, the point C1 and C2. Uh, so all of these degenerations look like I have two mark points on one side, three mark points on the other side, and I pinched in between to create a node. Um, so on the one side there, I have something with uh, four mark points. So there I get a copy of M04. So in other words, there's some invariant, the cross ratio of those four points that I can vary. And inside of the two-dimensional space M05, this gives a one-dimensional space that's essentially a copy of M04. 
So this is the divisor. Uh, and we can similarly get a section of L5. Uh, it's helpful to use it sort of, instead of eta 1, 2 that we used before, it's helpful to use something very similar that I'll call eta 2, 4. Uh, and that, that will, this section of L5 I get will be 0 when I separate Z5 from Z2 and Z4. Okay, and again, I'll get another divisor. So now I have a divisor representing uh, psi 4 and a divisor representing psi 5. And to compute the integral of psi 4 and psi 5, I really have to count the intersections. And you can count that there are exactly two of them. So actually, to have an intersection, you need to go to a further degeneration where at first you sort of squeeze one thing and separate it two points from three points. And now you have to squeeze another thing and sort of do some additional separation like that. And there are uh, two, two points like that. <coughs> So this, this intersection number uh, is 2. And you can see why these are called intersection numbers and we call this the intersection theory. Well, there's another point of view where you might represent these side classes by differential forms, and then you can integrate differential forms. So there are many different points. OK, questions about that? E to 1, 2 is, um, uh... Am I going to put one form just on a sphere? <coughs> yeah, it's a neuromorphic, so it's the unique neuromorphic one form. So it's just a rational function DT? Yes. Yeah. So you can write it down? You can write it down also, yeah. For the purpose of this Congress, I drew flat pictures. Uh, because people at this conference will relate to me, but actually it would be more typical to figure out what was happening by writing down an actual explicit formulas. A pair of rational functions you see them. Yep. Where you draw it, it may be a pair. Yeah, it might be a pair there. Exactly. Yeah, so there's another point of view. You don't have to draw these flat pictures. That's sort of a more modern point of view that people in our conference identify with this. But it would be more typical just to write down explicitly what these rational functions are, but certainly you can do. Other questions? Oh, okay, so this, this computation is not crucial to what follows. I just wanted to, to show you that, you know, these are fairly concrete things, at least in some cases you can compute. These are nice numbers. Um, and in general, uh, what we can do is we can take any product of these side classes, uh, but we want the, the total product to have degree that's equal to the dimension of the space, uh, so that I'll get an actual number out of this. So the dimension of MGN bar, the complex dimension, is 3G minus 3 plus N. So that means we want the sum of the degrees, the sum of the DIs, to be 3G minus 3 uh, plus N. Um, so these, these are actual numbers. Uh, you might want me to say that they're, they're non-negative integers, if they're supposed to count intersections. Um, but moduli space is an, an orbifold rather than a manifold, and that means that actually they're non-negative rational numbers. But anyway, they're, they're very concrete uh, numbers. And uh, they, they, there are some natural recursive relations between them that can aid in their computation. Um, so for example, you might take a product of psi classes where maybe the last psi class has power zero. So you're not using the psi class, you'd like to forget about the psi class. So you forget about the psi class, but then you remember, well, the sum of the powers has to be uh, the dimension of the space. And if you forget about that n plus first point, the dimension of the space goes down by one. So the natural thing to compare that to is, you know, compare that to just reducing one of the other powers by one. So the sum of the powers is still the dimension of the line by space. Do you have a question? <laughs> um, uh, anyways, there's, a, there's a, a, a theorem like that, it's called the string equation, it's not that hard to prove. It says that if you have a psi class with power zero, you can get rid of it and recover that value just by summing over all possible ways of uh, reducing one of the other psi classes' power. And obviously if the power is already zero, you can't reduce it any further. Okay. Um, uh, so this this uh, string equation, you can use it when one of the exponents of the psi classes is zero. 
So remember that the sum of the degrees is equal to the dimension of the modulated space. And in genus zero, that's n minus three. So in genus zero, you have the sum of the n degrees is equal to n minus three. So that means there are actually always at least three powers, the three exponents that are zero. So you can always apply the, the psi class to recursively compute these in genus zero. And this may be jived with your, your intuition from my example that these are really concrete things in genus zero that we can compute. And indeed, in genus zero, you can get a closed form formula uh, for the, the intersections of psi classes. Um, and actually, there's a, a second equation that comes together with uh, the string equations that's similar in many ways called the dilaton equation. Um, and if you use the string and dilaton equation together, uh, that gives you enough recursive relations to compute psi intersection numbers in genus zero and genus one. And in genus one, again, you get a closed form formula, although it's longer, um, involves symmetric functions, symmetric polynomials. Um, but in higher genus, these two equations are not enough to recursively compute uh, <coughs> intersection numbers. So you would like more recursive relations. Uh, and the natural setting uh, to talk about that is, is in terms of the generating function. Uh, so we'll form the genus key generating function for these intersection numbers <coughs> as I'm going to sum over n, take 1 over n factorial, and then I'll sum over all lists of integers, of non-negative integers d1 through dn that add up to uh, 3g minus 3 plus n. And then I'll take the intersection number, where I raise the psi classes to those powers, and then I'll have these formal variables, uh, td1 times tdn. So I want to emphasize right away that these variables, they don't keep track of which psi classes you use. All the psi classes are on even footing. None of them is distinguished compared to the rest. So you could permute the, the exponents, and it wouldn't make a difference. Rather, these variables keep track of the powers. Okay, so if you have a t2, then then you have a psi class to power 2. If you have a t3, you have a psi class to power 3. If you have a t3 squared, you have two psi classes to power 3. Um, OK. Uh, so uh, Gwynn made a conjecture in uh, something like 1990 um, that uh, when you combine these genus g generating functions with one more formal variable um, uh, to get this, this total generating function f, and you look at the exponential of f, then it's annihilated by a sequence of explicit differential operators, L minus 1, L0, L1, L1, et cetera, um, that satisfy some uh, specific commutation relation called the vera sorrow relations. Okay, so you should think of these, you know, a generating function satisfying a differential equation is some sort of recursion on the coefficients. So we started off having two recursive relations, and now we know infinitely many. Um, and again, you can say, what are the differential operators? And you should be careful what you ask for, it, or I'll tell you. Uh, so these are L minus 1 and L0. And the fact that e to the f is annihilated by these is equivalent to the string equation and the dilaton equation, which were already new. So the content of Wynn's conjecture was that it's also annihilated by ln when n is bigger than 0, uh, which is given by this uh, slightly intimidating formula. Um, okay, so uh, a few comments. So first of all, uh, Wynn's motivation in making this conjecture um, was that two different models for two-dimensional quantum gravity are the same. Uh, there shouldn't somehow only be one model. And in one model, it was clear that you should, you should uh, have a, a partition function, so this arises as a partition function in that theory, satisfying some differential equations. And this is another model, so we said in this model, the partition function should also satisfy these differential equations. Um, although I should say there are, there's an, a different form of Wynn's conjecture, an equivalent form in which you say that a second derivative of f satisfies the KDD hierarchy. And I believe that was the original form that the conjecture was made in. Um, OK. So uh, one of the key facts for us is uh, this, these uh, relations provide enough recursive relations to compute all of the intersection numbers. Um, okay, so not, not long after Kisevich, not long after we uh, made the conjecture, Kisevich, in sort of a real tour de force uh, proof, um, established that the conjecture is true. And what I'm going to talk about now is a different proof that Mirza Khani gave, 
I think she's, it was part of her thesis, she graduated in 2004, it didn't appear in print until 2007. Uh, and there were also several other new proofs of wind conjecture about the same time or earlier. Um, okay, so uh, how did Mirzakhani prove wind conjecture? It seemed very different from Jay Peterson volumes. So first of all, she came up with a different proof that these Ray Peterson volumes are polynomials. Um, and in the second proof, which I'll present to you in a moment, uh, the, the proof revealed a connection to intersection numbers. So these Ray Peterson volume polynomials encode intersection numbers plus more. And on the other hand, she had this other proof using McShane's identity that allowed her to recursively calculate these volume polynomials. So the volume polynomials encode intersection numbers, and she can recursively compute the volume polynomials, that means she can recursively compute the intersection numbers. So she was able to prove uh, Witten's conjecture in that way, combining the two different perspectives. Okay, so to talk about that proof, I need to move to an even bigger moduli space, uh, which I think Saul was capturing a glimpse of earlier. So in this bigger moduli space, which is called M hat, you allow the boundary uh, lengths of the circles to vary. And, and, and Saul already foresaw an issue with this because he said, you know, if the boundary circles can vary, well, there's no twist there, right? There's no twist, so how am I going to get this complexity for? So you do this in a, in a somewhat artificial but transparent way by adding a marked point to each boundary circle. And the position of that marked point acts as the twist parameter. Okay, so in this M hat, you have uh, Riemann surface with a boundary, the boundary can change, and there's a marked point that can move around each. And now we no longer allow the mark points, the, the boundaries have zero length. Cusp would no longer allow it. Um, okay, and as I said, this also has a, has a symplectic form that, that really has the same formula, d twist, which d length, where of the boundary circles, the mark point acts as the twist parameter. Okay, so there's uh, a bunch of circle actions on this space that are given just by moving the mark point along the boundary circle. Um, and uh, these uh, S1 actions are actually Hamiltonian for the function that records the squared lengths of the boundaries. And this is not a hard fact. Um, you know, in ventral Nielsen coordinates, this, this is like a linear function, where right? I just move this twist, this, this boundary position. Um, and so you have the standard symplectic form, so I'm just saying, and this sort of linear flow, and uh, you can compute very easily as a Hamiltonian. Now, the level sets for this function that records the length, um, uh, they're almost the space we started off with earlier, mg n l1 to ln. And you, fixing a level set is exactly fixing the length of all of the boundary curves. But I still have this mark point on each of the boundaries. So if I want to recover this moduli space I considered earlier, I can just take a level set and then quotient by the s1 to the n action. Um, and if you do that, I get the original space and it, it has sort of essentially the same symplectic form or a new version of it. Now, the fact that I took a level set for, this is a, a moment map in the terms of symplectic topology, the fact that I took a level set, quotiented it, and then got another symplectic uh, form, another symplectic manifold, is um, part of the general theory of symplectic reduction. So to talk about that a little bit, um, I would rather just restrict to the case of a circle action rather than n circle actions. So I'll, I'll think about a, a Hamiltonian S1 action on a symplectic manifold, M omega. So then in general, the level sets um, uh, for this moment map uh, are invariant by the S1 action. And when I quotient, I again get a natural symplectic manifold. This is something we witnessed in a special case on the, on the previous slide. Um, now, what Mirzakhani used uh, is what she called the normal form theorem, uh, the known theorem in symplectic topology that says that these, um, uh, as I change which level set you use, so maybe it's helpful to sort of think you're starting at the zero level set. That's like this sort of your, your reference point for comparison. And then you change which level set, um, then uh, your symplectomorphic back to the original um, manifold, but with a different symplectic form. Okay, so ma omega is 
ectomorphic to the original M0 omega 0, but with a different symplectic form, where you added A times the curvature uh, for the S1 bundle given by the level set. So again, MA is defined by the level set modulo uh, an S1 action. So the level set over MA is the principal S1 bundle. Okay. So what I want you to notice from this is that, in particular, the volume of MA omega A, the, the omega A volume, so to get that volume, I have to take this symplectic form and raise it to the top power integrating it. So the symplectic form is you know, omega naught plus A times something else. So I raise that to the top power and I get a polynomial. So uh, the volumes of these uh, spaces will vary polynomially in A. And this is fundamentally where Mirzakhan gets her, um, her uh, polynomiality in a second. Uh, so just to give you a slight idea where this comes from, to demystify it. So um, uh, a connection one form for an S1 bundle is just an invariant one form uh, that, that takes value one on vectors tangent to the S1 action. So you take that and then uh, the curvature form is nothing other than the exterior derivative of that. Somehow this is not such a complicated business. And how do you prove uh, that, that, that previous normal form theorem is very natural and pleasing. You say, I'm going to come up with some guess for what a neighborhood of the zero level set looks like for the moment. So topologically, it should look like the zero level set cross minus epsilon to epsilon. And then you say, okay, somehow I need to come up with a symplectic form on that. And so sort of one of the only things you can do is you can take the original symplectic form, which doesn't see the epsilon direction, and then you can add the derivative of t times the connection. And if you do that, you can check that for epsilon small enough that is a symplectic form. And it's sort of one of the themes of symplectic topology that's floppy enough that if you manage to come up with some guess for what something looks like, it's very often symplectomorphic to what it actually looks like. So you can show that uh, this uh, space with that symplectic form is symplectomorphic to a neighborhood of the zero section. So when you prove that, uh, you, you get this normal form there. So it's somehow very natural looking. Comes out of making a guess of what something looks like and showing it's compactomorphic to, to what it really looks like. So, um, uh, applied to this big moduli space, m hat, where we can vary the boundary lengths and we have a mark point on each boundary, what this gives you uh, is that the volume uh, is, so you have this factorial, that's because usually when you take the top power of this compactic form, you divide by a factorial to get a volume form, just by convention. Um, so what you get is you get uh, the the Peterson symplectic form, which you should think of sort of like what happens. That's the symplectic form when it's zero, except it's a little bit subtle because zero wasn't an allowed value uh, for the boundary lengths in omega hat. You have to take a limit. But anyway, essentially that uh, omega of Peterson, that's the symplectic form uh, when the moment map is zero, and then you get the the value of the 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 uh, the moment function times um, so D of the connection form will actually give you the psi class in this case. Uh, so the volume, the, the volume is not only polynomial, but um, and you can see again it's polynomial in the length squared, but all of the coefficients are intersection numbers, not just of the psi i's, but also with the the Peters symplectic form. So for example, if you wanted to know the, the constant term of this polynomial. That would encode the Dave Peterson volume of mg0, or sorry, mgn, but with zero boundary points, which is good. That's what it's supposed to. That's what you see here. Uh, and the top degree terms of this polynomial, that's what will encode um, the intersection of the psi classes. That's when you don't pick up any factors of the, the Dave Peterson symplectic form. Uh, okay, so uh, really, I think this is a fantastic connection between intersection theory and Dave Peterson. Uh, geometry that um, allowed Grizzly to compute these volumes and to relate them to intersection numbers uh, and in that way give a new proof of risk. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Um, so here you have omega naught plus a times this two form. So there you have omega naught plus um, the, the value of the, the moment map. So now it's a map to Rn, to R, so you get the sum times uh, the d of the connection form that gives you the side class. Further questions, let's thank the speaker again.